Hi, this is John Sturman, and I'd like to share with you what's under the hood, what's the structure of the En-ROADS model. So as you see in this picture, we begin with future population and economic growth. The model begins in the year 1990, and so we have 30 plus years of opportunity to compare the behavior of the model against the historical data. And then going forward to the year 2100, we have scenarios for future population growth in each of the six regions that we treat and future economic growth in GDP per capita for each of those regions. Those are scenario variables that you can change as an En-ROADS user. In addition, you're going to be choosing the policies and actions and assumptions that affect what happens with the evolution of the energy system. Those assumptions go into a model of the global economy and energy system, including energy demand, that means how much energy consuming capital stock is out there, how many vehicles, how many factories, how many buildings, et cetera, and how much energy do they use for each unit of output that they produce, the energy intensity. We divide the models, uh, energy consuming capital into transportation sector and buildings, stationary applications, that includes residential and commercial structures and industrial facilities. And we keep track of which ones are powered by electricity and which ones are powered by other fuels. And we keep track of the age structure, the ages of all these different capital units. A car purchased today is more efficient than an old clunker that's still on the road. And we keep track of all of that. On the energy supply side, we keep track of all the different fuels. I'll show you that next. And their carbon intensity, the carbon intensity of coal is greater than natural gas. And of course, solar and wind in use don't produce any carbon emissions. We keep track of the costs, including incremental technological progress and learning by doing that lower the marginal cost of the different technologies for all of them, fossil, renewable, nuclear, everything, uh, as cumulative experience and R&D increase. We keep track of the complementary assets that are needed. So for example, electric vehicles aren't useful without charging infrastructure. And we allow for carbon capture and sequestration in all the different fossil point source uh, generation facilities. The demand and supply interact through the marketplace. And so every period, every time step in the model, uh, prices fluctuate up and down until demand and supply balance at all points in time. That's the way markets work. And so that means that prices will vary according to demand and supply. And if prices are too low for existing energy production facilities to be profitable, the most expensive ones will be shut down. So capacity utilization, <clears throat> so capacity utilization will fall. The interaction of energy demand and supply through prices generates the carbon dioxide emissions from that energy system. In addition, the model keeps track of the non-carbon dioxide greenhouse gases, methane, nitrous oxide, the fluorinated hydrocarbons, and so forth. And those arise in the model from land use, agriculture, forestry, et cetera, and from industrial activity and from the energy system. For example, fugitive emissions of methane from the production and distribution of natural gas. All of those greenhouse gases then drive the climate sector of the model, which keeps track of the greenhouse gas concentrations, the amount of radiative forcing, that is the amount of excess energy that uh, the earth is, uh, is absorbing because the inbound solar radiation exceeds the outbound energy to space. We keep track of all the carbon and the heat as it's exchanged between the atmosphere and the ocean. We keep track of sea level rise, ocean acidification, and other impacts of climate change. So that's the high level view. Now let's take a look at the energy system. We keep track of the resources, production, processing and distribution of oil, natural gas, coal, biofuels, nuclear, hydro, solar, and wind and geothermal. Each of those is separate in the model but they are part of the total production of carbon-free renewable energy. 
We also have something we call new zero carbon technology. This doesn't exist right now, but we allow in the model for the possibility that there's a major radical technological breakthrough that would enable, for example, fusion power, 100% carbon free in use, uh, continuous production of electricity through fusion, or perhaps that radical breakthrough might be um, an artificial leaf that could take sunlight and produce energy from it that we can use. Users can decide if and when that kind of radical breakthrough occurs, even though in the real world, such a breakthrough cannot be counted on, it can't be scheduled. The production and prices of all these different sources of energy determine what fuels are delivered to the end users based on their decisions about what kind of fuel they wanna use, what kind of energy they wanna use and how efficient they are, but constrained by the slow turnover of the existing capital stock. And it determines how the electric production system produces power for us, which fuels are used based on their costs and uh, capital costs, operating costs, fuel input costs. So we can produce electricity and model from all these different fuels that you see here, oil, gas, coal, and biofuel, as well as nuclear, hydro, solar, wind, geothermal, and new zero carbon energy. Those fuels are then used by the energy consumption, the end use sector. Buildings and industry, so in the model, commercial and residential buildings are captured as are industrial facilities. So that would include steel making and cement and all the sectors that um, produce goods and services using energy and transportation. And those are separately represented. So that's how the energy system works. And that drives the bulk of global CO2 emissions in the world, which is CO2 arising from burning fossil fuels. How does the climate sector work? Well, here you see the climate sector of the En-ROADS model. The energy and economic system that we just described generates the carbon dioxide emissions from burning energy and the other greenhouse gases are accounted for as well, including the emissions that arise from land use and land use change and forestry, so-called Lulu CF. All the other greenhouse gases, including methane, CH4, nitrous oxide, N2O, sulfur hexafluoride, and the various fluorinated hydrocarbons, the CFCs, PFCs, and HFCs. The model represents 28 different species of these compounds because each one has a separate impact on global warming and a different atmospheric lifetime. We also keep track of aerosols, sulfate aerosols, which actually cool the surface, and black carbon, soot, PM2.5, for example, which is a warming agent. And we include in the model a range of carbon dioxide removal or CDR technologies, including afforestation, planting trees, sequestering carbon through improved agricultural practices, no-till, low-till agriculture, the use of manure instead of synthetic fertilizer, et cetera. BECS, which is bioenergy with carbon capture and sequestration. Biochar, which is pyrolyzing biomass, so heating it without oxygen which drives off volatile gases you can use to run an electric power turbine and leaves charcoal as the residue, which you can then bury and hope that that carbon stays out of the active carbon cycle. We include DAC, that's direct air capture, where you directly remove the CO2 from the atmosphere and then sequester it underground somehow, and enhanced mineralization, which is where you use, for example, basalt or other minerals, uh, which react with carbon dioxide to form limestone or other rocks and lock up that carbon in those minerals. All those different forms of emissions as modified by the potential for carbon dioxide removal drive the carbon cycle. The carbon cycle and the cycles for the other greenhouse gases, methane, nitrous oxide, et cetera, is represented separately and individually for each of those greenhouse gases. So that includes the emissions, the atmospheric stocks and the removals or removal fluxes of CO2 and all the other 
well-mixed greenhouse gases, the methane, the nitrous oxide, the fluorinated gases, et cetera. We keep track of the carbon in the biosphere with multiple compartments and in the oceans with a four layer ocean structure because of the slow transfer of heat and carbon from the surface layer of the ocean, which exchanges these materials with the atmosphere and the deeper layers. We keep track of the carbon sequestered by carbon capture and sequestration, by afforestation and by all the CDR technologies. The amount of carbon in the other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the concentrations of all those greenhouse gases in the atmosphere drives what's called radiative forcing, which is essentially the energy balance of the planet. And what greenhouse gases do is they suppress the radiation of infrared energy out to space, which means more energy then comes into the earth than is being radiated to space. And that increases the average temperature of the planet until it's hot enough again to bring the energy into balance. So we keep track of the net radiative forcing for each individual gas. We keep track of the carbon and heat transferred from the ocean to the atmosphere. And the model includes a wide range of feedbacks between the carbon cycle and the global climate, the temperature, uh, including the possibility of various tipping points. So for example, the warmer it gets, the more permafrost will thaw, which increases outgassing of carbon dioxide and methane in a reinforcing feedback loop that can lead to still more warming. Warmer average temperatures reduce winter snowpack in the Western United States, in Siberia, and in, in many parts of the world, and increases drying, which causes more wildfires and worse wildfires, and that puts more CO2 and black carbon into the atmosphere in additional reinforcing feedback loops. We also include what's called CO2 fertilization, where more CO2 in the atmosphere enhances the growth of certain plants, which removes more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. These are all standard and well-accepted feedbacks that exist in the carbon cycle, and they're all captured in the model. The rise in global average surface temperatures drives various impacts of climate change that are captured in the model, including sea level rise, the acidification of the ocean, and a variety of others that you can explore through the En-ROADS model. Well, that's a quick overview of how the model works from basic assumptions about population and future economic growth to the energy system and its impact on emissions through the carbon cycle and global warming to impacts like sea level rise that may harm human welfare.